We'll start with our first speaker, Steve LaFlem has uh, spoken with us before he was here last year at Astro Assembly and gave a really memorable talk. Uh, among many of the items he shared with us that he does as an amateur astronomer, uh, he showed us a star that he had uh, discovered, quote unquote, near a quasar, which was the, uh, the quasar was the object of his interest, but he tracked the motion of this star and got some data that was, was truly impressive. Yeah. And so his uh, topic today, turning deep into the Andromeda galaxy, I'm sure we'll have a lot more info in it than just the Andromeda galaxy. And uh, we're so glad you're able to return. Please help me give a warm skyscraper welcome to Steve O'Fran. Well, thank you, Scott, for that introduction. And uh, as, you, as you mentioned, my name is Steve LaFlam. I come to you from Bridgewater, Mass. I've been uh, into astronomy since 1978. Um, I know that pales in comparison to some of you all. Um, I enjoyed last night's presentations on Zoom. Uh, I'm honored to be back here again to give a talk. I'm, I'm thrilled that you thought it up with my talk last year to, to ask me to come back and do another one. Uh, with, at the outset, when you look at my topic today, it seems like a rather dry topic for a rainy day, no pun intended. Um, but I, I coordinated this talk specifically to this week. Uh, in the program, it says here that my, my topic is going to be peering deep into the Andromeda galaxy, which I'm going to do. You'll see that. Um, originally, I thought I would pick apart the Andromeda galaxy, you know, look at some of the star forming regions in the Andromeda galaxy, some of the satellite galaxies, uh, some of the dwarf galaxies that are extended beyond what we normally see associated with M31. Um, but then I realized that this week, uh, coincides with a very important week in astronomy that was exactly 100 years ago. The first week of October in 1923 uh, was a critical period for astronomy. And to me, it's one of the most profound discoveries in astronomy history. Um, we suddenly realized that our universe is a whole lot bigger than we thought. And um, I'm going to go over a little bit of the history, and I'm going to bring in some backyard um, recount or uh, confirmation of their work <laughs> um, and you'll, you'll get to see that. There is a point where I have to show pretty faint stars on a CCD image um, down to 18 and a half magnitude. I've tested it on the screen here and I think I can zoom in enough where you can you can pick up those stars. Um, and there's also a short five minute YouTube video in the middle of my talk. Uh, normally I don't like to sneak in videos, but I think this perfectly captured uh, the importance of what was going on in 1920, um, which led to this fantastic discovery in 1923. Uh, during my presentation, I don't mind being interrupted if you have any questions or if you have anything you wanna to add to the the, what I'm talking about currently, feel free to raise your hand and, and speak up. I, I welcome that. And also any questions that you have at the end, um, you'd be more than welcome to ask. Mm -hmm. uh, so this topic for me started with when I received the December 2021 issue of Sky and Telescope. Um, this is a couple of years old now, but in it, on, on right on the cover, you can see is a depiction of Henrietta Swan Levin, one of the most underrated astronomy people, you know, of all time. And the reason that they featured her in the December of 2021 issue was it was 100 years since her passing. She passed away in 1921. So there, there's a really nice tribute article to her in here. I knew virtually nothing about her before I sat on the couch and read the article in here. And after I read it, I was so impressed uh, that I studied more about her. And then that kind of snowballed into more and more research. And when I started to find out things about her and about how Edwin Hubble picked up on her, her work, I became fascinated with the story. I love astronomy detective work. Um, if you remember my talk on the, the moving star that we had found you know, in my backyard, um, it, was, it involved me digging into the internet and sending emails to professional astronomers and trying to get all the info that I could. And so I spent pretty much the last six or eight weeks or so putting this talk together, uh, listening to podcasts, uh, watching YouTube videos, uh, finding documentaries on this subject, reading magazines. And uh, I think I got a pretty good grasp of it, of the whole picture now. And that's what I'm here to share with you today. 
from the other side. I'll start with talking about Henrietta Swan Levin. Uh, she was born in 1868 in uh, Lancaster, Mass., which is just north of Worcester. Um, she was the uh, daughter of a minister, very religious family, uh, wealthy family. Um, she was rather an introvert. She, she kept to herself, but she was always very diligent about her work, no matter what it was. When it came time to go to college, she... Uh, enrolled at Oberlin College in Chicago and um, took up science and math classes. Um, she even picked up some music. She studied music while she was there. She didn't finish there. She got halfway through in two years there and returned to the Boston area where she enrolled in uh, astronomy undergrad classes and more mathematics classes at uh, the women's division of Harvard College, uh, which later became Radcliffe College, um, associated with Harvard today. Um, as I said, she was she was kind of a loner. She uh, when she was in her college years, she developed an illness, which ultimately led to her be to her becoming deaf. So she was deaf for the last thirty years or so of her life. Um, but that didn't stop her from pursuing her passion, which ultimately became astronomy. Uh, here's a black and white photo of the Harvard College uh, Observatory Complex. Um, That's a while ago. A while ago, yeah. A while ago, yeah. a while ago. before <laughs> color film, I'm guessing. Um, yeah, before talking horses, right. right. So... Back in the early 20s, she started there in 1908, but back in the early 20s, um, women were not allowed to use the telescope equipment at Harvard, unfortunately. There was a prejudice against them. They worked for, for a lesser, uh, lesser salary. Um, her pay at the time was only $10.50 a week, which equates to today's $342 a week, which is still only about $8 an hour. Um, Still not not a very good pay. And what these computers they were called, this team of women, about 40 women, they were called computers, and their job was to carefully scrutinize astrophotographic plates and look for things such as novae and uh, asteroids, comets, and particularly variable stars. You can even see variable star charts on the wall back there. You can see you know the up and down curve of a Beta Arrigae over there, um, and a, a, a plot of um, star brightnesses up top there. That gentleman in the back, the far left corner back there is uh, Edward Pickering. He was the uh, he was the head of the observatory, so he was in charge of overseeing their work. These are the instruments of the day. <laughs> Not very complex. Uh, magnifying glass was her best friend. Um, and she quietly went about her work. I'm going to go so over some of the instruments that they used here. The uh, magnifying glass speaks for itself. You know, they were looking at small glass plates of stars. And when they wanted to zoom in, they simply used a magnifying glass. Uh, this interesting box here is called a plate view, plate viewer. Yeah. And what they would do is they would take the glass plate that came off the back of a telescope, the exposure here. I think this is the Orion Nebula, I believe. Yeah but they would put the glass plate here after it was quote unquote developed and set it on this angle part here and, and laying down flat here is a mirror. So they would, they would position this viewfinder near a window or let the, the natural light come in, reflect the light through the back of the glass plate so that they could see it more clearly and look for, for particular stars. Here's a woman using it here with a, a little loop, you know, magnifier. Uh, the, the mirrors are reflecting the sunlight so that she can review the plate. So rather primitive, you know, but it's the best they had back in the day. Right in the center here, you see another, another instrument here. And this was very common for them to use is, a, is an assortment of these, uh, these small, uh, almost like plates held on a, on a little wire handle. Um, I have a, a small door prize here. It's a small piece of meteorite. 
that I'll give to the person that can tell me what the name of these fly spankers fly spankers. <laughs> you do that right away. Oh, I'm kind of worried. <laughs> uh, a fly spanker, what that was, is they took uh, small pieces of previously obtained glass plates and they um, very uh, meticulously put down the magnitudes of, of certain stars so that they could use this to hold up to another plate to estimate magnitude ranges based on their calibrated, um, you know, previously calibrated star magnitudes. So depending on looking, you know, uh, for a particular magnitude range, probably had a different different fly spanker, as, as they called them back in the day. Um, so that was another commonly used tool of the day. Uh, Harvard College Observatory, um, obviously being located in Cambridge, Mass, did not have access to the southern skies. So it had a spin-off satellite observatory um, at Boyden Station, this was called. And this is in Arequipa, Peru, um, so that the Harvard College branch down there could see things south of the equator that we never see up here in the, in, that they could see in the southern sky. Um, so their mission down there was to photograph other areas of the sky that we couldn't see. In particular, they were interested in getting images of the, the, the large and small Magellanic clouds. Um, there, there was a lot of uncertainty as to what these were back in the early 20th century, but it's pretty obvious to see that they were star clusters, basically very congested star clusters visible to the naked eye. Yeah, both the large and the small Magellanic cloud. And they became a, the topic of interest and were assigned to Henrietta Swan Leavitt to really scrutinize and look for uh, variable stars in these clouds. And what she did is she reviewed thousands and thousands of plates. And her mission was to look for variable stars, stars that change brightness over time. So what she'd have to do is, is review a plate, uh, wait a week, a month uh, afterwards, and review another plate and find the star that changed brightness. It seemed like a formidable task, to say the least. Uh, this is one method that they use to do that. I'm going to show you right here. Um, anyone familiar with photography back in the day, film photography, um, if, when you got your pictures back from Photomat, Photomath or Kmart or wherever back in the day, they would always slip the negatives in a little sleeve so that you could print out more photos if you wanted to, your hard copy photos. So the negative is always like the flip reverse of the actual photo. So here's the Orion belt, the Orion nebula. This is what you would see in a photograph and that would be the accompanying negative. So there's a positive and a negative. And what they would do is this. Uh, Okay, perfect. So this was an artificial field of stars that I created in Photoshop. And I created two, I put one on top of the other. I made one for September and then one for October. They're basically the same. You don't expect too much change from month to month, but they're, they're the same star field. And what they would do to make it easier to detect stars that change brightness is they would change one. I'm going to change the change one um, to a negative of itself. You'll see here uh, mode adjustment invert. Okay, so I change one to a negative. You got one negative, one positive. See that same star field taken a month apart, a positive and a negative, and then by simply uh, changing the opacity or putting one on top of the other and looking at it, you know, perfectly matched up on one of maybe those viewfinders near an open window and changing it so that you could see 50% through each of these plates. I changed the opacity to exactly 50%. And you see what happens here? Everything cancels itself out except for the stars that change brightness. <laughs> this one over here on the right. That one on the right, I actually made one step dimmer than between the months, you know, September and October. I made that one one step dimmer. And then that one on the left, 
I cranked it up one step, just a small bit brighter than it was. And they jump right out at you. So this is how she was able to find 1,777 variable stars in the small and large Magellanic clouds just by using this method. Um, seems simple, but it's very effective. You know, when I change the op opacity back, um, let me show you. Right, let's go back again. All right, see that there? See how it stands right out? I'm going to mm -hmm. change it back to regular. Oh, what happened there? How did that happen? Hang on one second. Okay. Change this back to the original mode. And now when I switch on and off, see that how it changes from month to month? Mm -hmm. It's easy to see now where we know where we have to look and we zoom in on it. But when I do that, that flip, it stands out much more easy, more readily than it would normally. Any history on how that methodology was derived? I imagine it was trial and error, you know. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I mean, they have the two plates. How do you make whatever change jump out at you? I know a blink comparator nowadays is used to find asteroids. You know, but but variables are different because they don't really move across the field at all. You know, all they do is get slightly brighter and dimmer. So someone obviously figured out this was the way to do it. Um, otherwise, you'd go nuts trying to review every single star and comparing them all from month to month. Um, I'll go back to the other. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So basically, that's what they did. To uh, to find these variables that we saw, um, the best known variable star going way back into history was Algol, uh, the demon star in the constellation Perseus. And the thing about Algol um, is that its change is rather dramatic, and it's over a short period of time. So it can be studied naked eye if you look in sky and telescope magazine there's always a little chart in there in the middle of the section uh, the monthly highlight section that, that tells you when the minima of algal is going to be happening when it's going to be its dimmest um, so you can go out when this is when this is happening look at it say oh yeah and compare it to a couple other stars up there wait a few hours and go out again and it's brightened back up again it's it's pretty neat naked eye uh project to get out there and do it this is the time of year that now until spring, it's a good chance to get out there and see this in the works. Um, one of the lesser known uh, variable stars up there is Delta Cepheus, which I pointed out there, I circled it. It changes from 3.5 to 4.4. It's not quite a dramatic uh, range in magnitude that alcohol has, and it's over five and a half days. So it's less readily noticeable. Uh, but the gentleman who did discover this and study it is John Goodrick. He, um, he, let me see where it says John Goodrick here. I got to get my facts straight. I'm trying to think what country he was from. England, of all places. Okay. <laughs> so 1790s, he studied uh, Delta CPI in great depth. And he noticed that it had a sawtooth shape to its up and down peaks, a very particular uh, rapid rise, slow decline, rapid rise, slow decline. And he only lived to be 22 years old. He, he too was deaf. I don't know how we got so many deaf astronomers, but um, he studied algal. He, he was the first one to determine or figure out correctly that algal is a eclipsing binary, a dimmer star moves in front of a brighter star and dims it periodically. And then he discovered the variation of delta CPI, um, a very important variable star, as you're going to see. Here's a chart of its, of its up and down brightness. It goes up 3.5. The lower the number, the brighter the star. So it goes up rapidly and then declines over five and a half days um, forever. 
And what happens is the star swells up, um, gravity takes over, it shrinks down. So you can see across the top there, the star gets bigger, gets brighter, and then over a period of time, it slows down until um, the, the pressure, the gas pressure expands it back out again, and then gravity takes a hold and pulls it back in again. And uh, this is very typical of a Cepheid type variable. The other thing about Cepheid variables is they tend to be super luminous, uh, 1,000 to 10,000 times brighter than the sun. They're extremely bright, and which makes which is important because they can be seen from very far away, as you're going to see that's critical. I mentioned that Henrietta Swan Leverett found 1,700 variables in the, the large and small Magellanic clouds. Um, she was able to find, she was specifically, after a while, Pickering, Edward Pickering assigned her to just study the variables in the small cloud. And it was assumed at the time that all the stars in that particular star cluster were about the same distance from Earth. You know, they're in a, a family of stars, therefore they're, they're probably um, about the same distance from us. And what she found over time, she, she plotted maybe 20 or 30 um, of these Cepheid variables, she noticed that their bright peak, the brightness of them, here it's about 15th magnitude, that's a, the brightest they get. And then she plotted the lower, the dimmest they get down here, the dimmer as you go lower. She noticed that as their, their brightness goes up and down, based on the period of time, this is the log of time, it's not the actual time of, of days or weeks, um, it's a logarithmic, um, great graduation down there. But she noticed a correlation. She was able to draw straight lines between the two and notice that the brighter the star got, the longer its period was. So if, if a star is bright way up here, 12th magnitude, you can see that its period to fluctuate in brightness is longer. This, this is time here. And like this one here, like really bright star up here, 10th, 11th magnitude, Cepheid variable, it takes a long time to go through its cycle, which is very, very important because if you can measure a star's period, um, then it gives away what its brightness is, um, which, which became known as the, the period luminosity relationship. Um, and Henrietta Leavitt Swan was the first to notice this which was pretty amazing because it, it provided the first key for us to be able to measure things that were very, very far away. One of her famous, uh, in, a, in a paper when she submitted this finding, she, she mentions that a straight line drawn between the points correspond to the brightness and dimness and show a relationship between the brightness um, and the, the period of time. This became known as Levitt's Law. Um, light follows a pretty pretty simple uh, physics equation. Um, every time you, you step away from the light source a little bit more, um, it, it decreases in brightness by the square. For instance, if we're at the sun and we're one unit from the sun, uh, then the units would be one. But if you move twice as far away, twice the distance, then it's one over the distance squared. So the sun would only be one quarter as bright. Move again, you know, to three times as far away, it's one over the distance squared. So it's only one ninth as bright. So by doing the backwards math on that is another way that to show it shows a light. And for every, for every step away, the concentration of that light gets dimmer and dimmer. Um, You can see how dramatically, like it's only one one hundredth as bright as bright at ten units away than it is from one unit away. So we 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 had a key part of the puzzle solved, um, but we still needed to determine. We needed at least one or two um, Cepheid variables where we knew the brightness and we knew the distance in order to add to, in order to work backwards and look at all these other Cepheid variables and something as far away as the Magellanic clouds, we, we had to have a calibration. We, and the, the one, the, the gentleman that finally uh, was able to do this 
was Ejnar Hertzsprung. He's, he's of the Hertzsprung Russell diagram fame. Um, up until this time, our primary means of figuring distances was to use parallax. You've probably been asked before, are you are shaking your head? No, you don't know what parallax no. is. Okay. Have, have you done the, the yeah. finger in front, like with one eye and the other eye, and your finger moves back and forth, and then you can figure out the distance between your eyes and how far it moves back and forth to figure the distance to your finger? Right. Follow me on that. <laughs> I, I think you're, at one point or another, you've probably been asked to hold your finger out, blink back and forth, and see that it moves back and forth. So that was the primary method of figuring stellar distances. Um, that's only good to about 60 light years away. That's not very far away. Um, so what he did, he used a process called spectroscopic parallax, which I don't, I didn't quite follow how that works. It's not important to dig into, but he was able to figure out uh, the, the distance of a few Cepheid variable stars, which kind of paved the way uh, for figuring out distances based on luminosity. I know the math gets a little bit hairy here. The, the main part of the equation is right here. So if, if we want to know the distance to a star, the, the star that, if we want to know the distance of that particular star, we take its intrinsic luminosity, you know, the square root of the luminosity over four pi times b, it's, it's apparent brightness to us. So that's kind of the equation that tells us how far away stars are based on just looking at this period of change in, in its brightness. As I mentioned earlier, uh, Henrietta Swan Leavitt was deaf for the last 30 years of her life. She only lived to age 53. Um, she developed stomach cancer and, and passed away. This is her, her family burial site. This is at Cambridge Cemetery. Um, it mentions her her passing, and even though at the time she passed away in 1921, at the time she had no idea what her discovery was going to lead to, unfortunately. And later on, three four years later, um, some of the, the the famous physicists and astronomers of the day recommended her for a Nobel Prize in physics, um, but they they do not award that posthumously, and also she was never given that honor. Um, and, and as I feel, and I was talking to Scott earlier before I started the talk, I feel that she is so underrated and, and underappreciated. Um, it was finally Edward Pickering, upon her passing, said that it was her work that handed a ruler to measure the universe. And even though I've kind of described that so far, I'm going to explain it better as you go. And you can see how her stars really held the key for us. Um, last week, I thought, you know, I wonder if there's an asteroid named after her, at least, you know, we have we have asteroids named after the Beatles, you know, Spock has, has an asteroid. Um, you know, there's, there's asteroids named after lesser, uh, lesser um, astronomy and physics superstars. Um, so I, I looked up asteroid 538311, and I said, oh, maybe I'll take an image of that, the backyard scope, and I'll bring it to the presentation and say, oh, look, is, is her, her asteroid. It turns out it was just north of Regulus in the constellation Leo, which, if you know, is very low in the dawn sky right now. Um, and the second thing, and this kind of disappointed me a little bit, is that it's at magnitude 19.4. <laughs> <laughs> So you talk about getting no respect, right? Um, to get to a very dim asteroid, and unfortunately, it was not visible for my area for this time. It wouldn't have been visible to her either. What do I think? What? That magnitude nineteen point four was beyond what she. Would it's have just seen. very dim. I think she deserves a brighter one. Right? Yeah, but she wouldn't have been even. She wouldn't have been able to see it on the photographic plates. It's they could barely big, reach yeah. that magnitude. Yeah, yeah, you're right. They could real barely, barely reach that. So then I thought, well, all right, I can't I'm get guess it. it was about a mile to a mile and a half at that yeah. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. I thought, well, oh well, maybe she's got a crater on the moon now. Yeah. Oh, sure enough, she does. It's great, right? What an honor. 
It happens to be on the far side of the moon. <laughs> so this is the back side that we never see. So again, her, her name gets dragged through the mud. <laughs> she finally got a, a write up in the National Enquirer. You know, a, a very prominent scientific uh, publication. Um, yeah, this is a 1975 issue of the Enquirer magazine. So. You know, certain neighbors, your neighbor's chicken livers and a recipe. So, again, no respect to Rodney Dangerfield of astronomy. <laughs> However, in recent years, there's been a, a play that's gone around to the various playhouses and theaters around the country called Silent Sky which I imagine is named due to her deafness. Um, it even played locally. I don't know if any of you saw it locally. In Boston. Massachusetts. Yeah. yeah. I, I wish I had seen it. I, I can't find that it's still playing anywhere. Um, but ever since I picked up interest in this topic, I really wish that I had, had taken in this play. Um, his scene here of her with another one of the computers. Um, hmm. And then another discussion here, looking at plates. Yeah, they have the viewfinders there on the on the table. Um, so she finally got a little bit of recognition in that play. Now, in the late 1920s, and this is a chart from I think the 1800, late 1800s or so. But the Andromeda M31, that hazy thing in Andromeda was still called a nebula. And you can see it here on the map, right? Right here. And it's got a little M next to it. It's just a nebula. It's just a cloudy patch and we don't know what it is. Um, moving ahead, this is a page from the old Norton Star Atlas, I think. And again, it's called the Andromeda Nebula or short for nebula. Um, just a cloudy patch, we don't know what it is. In the 1700s, uh, this gentleman, Laplace, along, he was following along the paths of the German philosopher, Immanuel Kant, and they had formulated um, the nebula hypothesis. They correctly figured out that the solar system, the sun and the planets were born out of swirling gas and dust that over time coalesced and coagulated to make the sun the heat up and, and ignited to the sun and the planets as well. So this was the nebula hypothesis. And it was pretty widely accepted at the time as the formation of the solar system and accurately so. Um, William Parsons, you might've heard of this gentleman who was, who was the, the builder of this gigantic telescope in Burr, Ireland. This is the Leviathan telescope. It's 72 inches in diameter. It had a speculum mirror at the bottom there, and uh, it's still in existence today. Um, not in use, I don't think, but it's still there. And one of the one of the more famous drawings to come out of his observatory there with this with this was this sketch of uh, the Whirlpool Galaxy M fifty one. It started to show spiral structure. You know, and you can see it, the second one over there and the core there, um, kind of keeping in tune with that nebula hypothesis is that things form due to rotation and coagulation. Um, a little, little better picture here, trying to show what's happening here, but we still didn't understand what exactly it was or how far away it was, uh, which leads us right up to 1920. At this point in the early 20th century, the debate became so heated that um, there was finally a a, a a meetup of Heber Curtis. He was the one that thought that the universe encompassed more than just our Milky Way. You know, that, the, that these, these nebula that we see out there are more Milky Way. The word galaxy wasn't even around yet. Um, but he was he was the proponent proponent of of Highland universes, you know, the Milky Way here, Andromeda Galaxy there, Whirlpool Galaxy there, all separated. Harlow Shapley, on the other hand, uh, did a lot of work with globular clusters. He studied um, RR Lyrae type variables in globular clusters. And he was the one that 
that was able to show that we were not quite the center of the Milky Way. We we're off a little bit, but he showed the halo of globular clusters around the, the you know, the center of the Milky Way. Um, he was able to do a pretty good map out of um, the structure of our own Milky Way galaxy and the globular clusters that encompass it. Um, so this, this debate was held in 1920 at the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History in Washington, DC. Um, it was open to the public. I wanted to be a fly on the wall at that one. Um, so the debate went on and they basically were deadlocked. Um, I think that this, a summary of this debate is important enough that I'm gonna show you a five minute YouTube video on the sides that they took and the results of the debate. Um, it's a pretty, pretty light video, um, but I think it's important because, because of the time and because of the arguments of both sides uh, let's see if we can bring that up. Historically, astronomers didn't know how stars, star clusters, and nebulae were distributed through space. Sure, they saw them, and they knew that the fainter ones were likely further away, but the question remained, primarily because there was no reliable method to determine the distances to these objects. Astronomers simply didn't know how big the universe actually was. They, of course, had looked up at the night sky for centuries and were able to identify a whole plethora of different types of objects, but a few certain things stood out to them. Take, for example, the Andromeda Galaxy. We know that it's a galaxy, but just over a hundred years ago in the 1920s, astronomers were still working to figure out the details of these things that they called spiral nebulae. Some other mysterious objects in the night sky were the large and small Magellanic Clouds, which we now classify as galaxies as well, but the astronomers of the 1920s were still baffled by these celestial clouds. The modern-day astronomers of the 1920s saw these stars and clusters and nebulae in their observations, but the one thing that they couldn't get quite right just yet were these oddly structured spiral nebulae, as they called them. We look at these images now and think, oh, duh, that's a distant spiral galaxy. But astronomers like Heber Curtis, working at Lick Observatory near San Jose at the time, didn't know that yet. He had a feeling that these objects are not part of our galaxy, but there really wasn't a consensus on whether or not the Milky Way was the only galaxy out there. Were we alone? That was the hot topic of the Great Debate of 1920 described here in its 26th of April press release as follows. This evening, two California astronomers will discuss the size of the universe and present their views as to whether or not there is only one or several universes before the National Academy of Sciences, which is now in session in Washington. In 1920s scientific lingo, the word universe was used in place of where we would use the word galaxy today. So this basically meant that the two astronomers were about to go head to head in a heated discussion regarding the scale and the multiplicity of the universe. Was there more than one galaxy and are we that only galaxy or not? In the program for that day, it was advertised that the debate would begin at 8.15 in the evening to be followed by conversations with the scientists afterwards. Each speaker individually presented their theory during the discussion and then held that joint open forum in the evening for questions. Mount Wilson Observatory's Harlow Shapley argued that while we may not be at the center of our galaxy, our galaxy is the entire universe and it's much bigger than we previously thought. These spiral nebulae that everyone's so caught up on are just celestial objects in the Milky Way. Heber Curtis, however, argued that these spiral nebulae are island universes of their own, located far away from our own island universe. Now, there was no immediate winner of the debate. Each of these two scientists would go on to publish an article in the May 1921 issue of the Bulletin of the National Research Council, where they focused on the validity of their own theory, while also providing counter-arguments against the others in hopes of disproving it. But a resolution would only come after Edwin Hubble steps into the picture. His observations of the Andromeda Galaxy in 1923 showed a star that he had not noticed before. Originally believing it to be a nova, he continued to photograph the Andromeda Galaxy and realized that this new star was actually a Cepheid variable. Now this was the golden needle in the proverbial haystack because he had found something in the Andromeda that would actually yield a calculation to the distance to that galaxy.
These are the more recent images of the very same star that Hubble observed, taken by the telescope that is his namesake, the Hubble Space Telescope. And the same four images are superimposed here on an image of the Andromeda galaxy itself, for context. Now the question was, was the Andromeda galaxy, or the nebula as they called it at the time, part of the Milky Way galaxy, or was it a standalone object all by itself? As it would turn out, Hubble's distance calculations using Levitt's law for that Cepheid variable called V1 yielded a very large value for the distance to that star. This Cepheid variable was so far away that it could not have been within the boundaries of the Milky Way. The Milky Way itself measures only 100,000 light years from one end to the other, and the Andromeda's distance well surpassed that. It would be impossible for the Andromeda to be a feature of the Milky Way if it's found nearly two and a half million light years away from us. With that in mind, Hubble was able to confidently say that the Andromeda was a standalone object after all. It was a whole galaxy on its own. This implied that many of the similar great nebulae or spiral nebulae that astronomers had been working on previously were now going to be reclassified as galaxies. So, who won that great debate? There really was no one winner. They were both right on different accounts. Shapley was right to say that we're not at the center of the Milky Way galaxy, and Curtis was right in saying that the spiral nebulae are actually individual isolated galaxies located at vast distances in a much larger universe, to which we all belong. Here we can see a modern representation of the relative distances and inclinations between the Milky Way, Andromeda, Triangulum, and other nearby galaxies. In fact, the Andromeda and Milky Way galaxies are on course to collide in the near future. In the near astronomical future, I should say. The following series of images simulate the changes that we'll see in the night sky when that finally happens, though we probably won't be around to see it ourselves. So enjoy! Was this before we knew there were black holes? Uh, I'm trying to look right now. Yeah. Since two years, years ago. Did you see? Yeah, after the merge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. I thought that video summarized the debate of the day pretty well in a short period of time. Um, she, the narrator kind of jumped ahead of some of my slides upcoming, but the next portion, I'm going to show how Edwin Hubble used that data to, um, to determine the distance to the Andromeda galaxy. So Edwin Hubble uh, grew up in Missouri. He was born in the late 1800s. He was a sportster. He was an athletic uh, basketball player, football player, trackster. He um, science and mathematics guy. He graduated from the University of Chicago a bit earlier than most, uh, which earned him a Rhodes Scholarship. He attended Oxford University in England, um, where he obtained a law degree. His father really pushed him to become a lawyer. He didn't think there was any future in being an astronomer, even though that was Hubble's first passion. Uh, 
so while Hubble was over in England, the conclusion of his his college studies over there, uh, World War One was starting up in 1917. And he went into the army for a couple of years. In the meantime, his father had passed away, and at the conclusion of the war, his his um, his interest in astronomy was so great that he already had a relationship with George Ellery Hale of the Mount Wilson Observatory in California. And there was a brand new 100 inch Hooker telescope. So as soon as he got out of the army, he already had a job lined up to look for um, the answer to what these nebulae were, what these spiral nebulae were. Um, it's kind of funny because while he was in um, at Oxford University in England, they say he became an Anglophile. He fell in love with the British way. Um, he was seen smoking a pipe quite often, which he never did before he went over there. He also picked up a British accent, <laughs> which people thought, oh, over here, people thought was rather pompous, you know, of him to pick up. He was often seen wearing a big cloak. Um, he, he, he brought England back with him, you know, and, and he kind of was a little bit viewed, viewed unfavorably because of that. Um, here he is at the top of the stairs here at the new uh, Mount Wilson Observatory in California. To the left is Einstein. Yeah, you might not be able to see him from the back row back there. Um, there's a postcard depicting the, the Mount Wilson Observatory and the telescopes that he used. Here's a picture of the 100-inch Hooker telescope. Um, looks to me to be like a Newtonian, right? Or a Cassegrain of some sort. Certainly not a refractor. Um, but that's where Edwin Hubble began his work. Here he is peering through the scope. I think he's lining up to take a plate of an area of the sky. Um, we all know what collimating a telescope is like, right? Here he, here he is up at the secondary mirror, I think adjusting it to line up with the primary down at the bottom there. So he really got into his work. <laughs> This is the back of the telescope. This is where they would slide in the uh, the emulsion the emulsion covered glass plates in there to be exposed to the incoming beam of light. Um, this is only four inches by five inches, rather small, rather small uh, area. And this is only a portion of the back of the scope, but this is what was used to collect plates of the sky. This is the most significant plate that he collected. Um, I'm going to zoom in on a little bit on this if I can. Let's see. You can see the date that he's got written on there. He's got, oops. He's got October 6th, 1923, which is only a week from being 100 years ago exactly. And the other thing is, he's got some ends on there where he thought he discovered some novae. Um, it was that guy, Heber Curtis, that used various nova to um, to try. It. They were thinking that was the way that they were going to find the distance to, to these other far away nebulae. Except up top there, as soon as I go to the next slide, he crosses off the end and he puts variable there. He looked at previous plates and he realized that that was a variable star that he had, had found, the first of its type found in another uh, nebula. This is log entry for that day. I'll summarize for you what it says there. It's kind of some head scratching. Um, it was taken on uh, October 5th, 1923. Uh, two, three stars were identified as Novi, except when he went back and looked at his, his plates from a, a, a week or two earlier. And then it was determined that that was actually a variable. And when he followed the brightness for the next month or so, it was determined to be a Cepheid variable. So he, it was a it was a huge discovery because by working the math back backwards in that formula that I showed you earlier, we could get an answer as to how far away this thing was. Is his plot of the different magnitudes? Um, it ranges in magnitude from eighteen at the brightest. And it goes down to 19.4 or so, and it's dim, and then it quickly brightens up again. So it follows the typical path of a, a rapid rise in brightness and a slower decline in brightness over time. So it was classified as a Cepheid variable, which was very important. Here he is with a picture of the Andromeda galaxy. Is the newspaper announcement 
he didn't announce this right away. He, because of his lawyer background, he wanted to make sure he had all his ducks in a row, all the facts straight. He didn't want to be proved wrong down the line. He had too much pride for that. So the word leaked. You know, it leaked to other astronomers. It really did not make the newspaper, except you see that it's mentioned here that he 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 figured out that this thing is 700,000 light years away, the Andromeda galaxy. We know it now to be three and a half times farther away than that. A couple of reasons why his math was off. Uh, the instrumentation of the day, you know, they're looking at glass plates. We have much better technology nowadays. Um, there was a another variable star called W Virginis variable star, which kind of mimics the, the Cepheid variable. Um, so if he was looking at some of those, his data might have been wrong. And then over time, they also discovered that there's a, a Cepheid variable type two, which is slightly different than the, the classical Cepheid variable. So those are just some of the reasons why his math might have been wrong, but he clearly showed that it was outside of our own Milky Way galaxy. So getting into the the lab part of this presentation. Um, I'm gonna show you what I did with these images and with these with this finding um, on my own. There's a book that came out in 1983, Atlas of the Andromeda Galaxy. Uh, it's basically just page after page of, of images of sections of the Andromeda Galaxy uh, taken on glass plates. And right inside the, the first couple of pages there, up in the corner here, they tell about the plates. So the plates that are in this book were taken with a four meter telescope, Kitt Peak Observatory, and they were taken in 1974. So, um, and exposed for 25 minutes. So I thought what I would do is take this index, it shows the entire Andromeda galaxy, and that particular star that Hubble had found is on plate number six. See number six at the middle there, um, right in this area. So I found that page in the book, which I have here. Um, there's a lot of outlines on here. There's there's a lot of uh, uh, dark areas marked with Ds. There's, there's Gs for globular clusters that are part of this Andromeda galaxy. Um, what else is here? It just shows areas of, of star forming regions, dark areas. Um, and different changes in the, the nebula itself. So I took this chart, copied it, and... Okay, so there's Hubble's original plate. And I took that page from the book and lined it up directly over, matched up the stars and made it, resized it so that it lines up perfectly. See that? You can see through it. So when I zoom way, way in here to his particular star, let's see. Okay. Yeah. Yep. You see, you see this triangle is going to be critical. Can you see that triangle in the back row? Yeah. I was a little worried because those are 18th and 19th magnitude stars. Um, but he highlighted that particular star. That's the Cepheid variable that he found. And when I line up the Lick Observatory plate over that, unfortunately, the line, you know, from the little peanut-shaped uh, outline of a dark area or the nebula exactly coincides with where the star should be. I can change the, the opacity a little bit. See, that's the Hubble line. Oh, yeah. And and it's it's almost part of the line, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So inconclusively, it shows very, uh, Hubble star. I assume that it is there because we're talking about a four meter telescope should be able to pick this up. Um, but to me, it wasn't it, it wasn't a perfectly sharp depiction mm -hmm. of uh, of the variable. Mm -hmm. So I went back to the back to the drawing board. Let me close this one. Oh. Minimize this. Stop the share.
Yeah. We fast forward to the Hubble Space Telescope. I know we're switching gears here. We'll see why in a minute. The Hubble Space Telescope was named after him um, because it represents kind of a frontier outside of what we know. Um, also, too, what came of Hubble studies was the realization that the farther away these galaxies were, this is five or 10 years after this discovery of his, five or 10 years afterwards, he worked to, to show that galaxies were moving away faster the farther away they were from us, um, so that the groundwork was laid for the Hubble constant. You know, we're trying to figure out the exact rate of expansion of the universe. Um, so that was the primary mission of the Hubble Space Telescope when it went up, was to finally determine the exact number uh, for the Hubble constant. Um, so the Hubble went up in the early 1990s, and in May of 2009, it required a servicing mission. And John Grunsfeld, who was one of the astronauts, a specialist, actually carried up that original glass plate that Hubble had taken in 1923. He brought it up to the Hubble telescope as kind of a, a tribute to Hubble, which you know, the thing is so fragile, you know, and it's got to go all the way up and just survive a blast off and a landing, you know, and have nothing happen to it. It was kind of a risky move at the time. So here's the plate. There it is up in space. And then it came back down. So um, while the, the plate made it back up there, safely returned to Earth and and. Dr. Grunsfeld made it back too, but it was up there for the, the final spacewalk mission to repair the, the lenses on the Hubble. But that was only a four by five plate. Only a four by five plate, yeah, small glass plate. This slide was shown a bit earlier in that YouTube video. And what this shows is a large image of the Andromeda galaxy. This this picture was taken by Robert Gambler. He's one of the best astrophotographers around. He's, he lives in um, Connecticut. He's an anesthesiologist by day, and he's a fantastic astrophotographer by night. So he took this picture of the Andromeda galaxy. The Hubble Space Telescope took this small, see the small square there? This is this is a picture of that area through the Hubble Telescope. Here's the triangle of stars that we talked about earlier. You know, the same triangle that's up here in Hubble's plate, and that's the Cepheid variable there. So the, the Hubble Space Telescope was actually looking back on its on its namesake star, which was kind of a neat project. Um, there's the changes in its magnitude, you know, from December to January. You can see it gets brighter over that time. Um, there was a call out to the American Association of Variable Star Observers to have amateurs see if they could get images of this and follow its um, change in brightness over time. So this bulletin was sent out and there were 10 amateurs from around the world that participated in this um, study of the changes in magnitude. Mm -hmm. And over, over the course from July to January in 2010, 2011, all these little red dots here are the amateur readings, you know, the amateur uh, measurements of the changes in magnitude. So you can see it follows this, this pretty up and down uh, pattern here ranges from magnitude 18 at its brightest down to 19.4 and the period is about 31 days and then the Hubble Space Telescope did the same thing took measurements and these four stars show the, the four measurements that the Hubble Space Telescope took and it coincides with the with the graph just perfectly as far as me personally, my experience with the Andromeda galaxy got started when I bought this, this planisphere um, at the Mystic Seaport gift shop. I wasn't, <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't interested in the ship, so I wanted to, to look at the stars, so I found this in the gift shop. And right in the center there, there's, there's you know the Great Square of Pegasus, and right there, the only one on this chart was a galaxy. And, you know, being a 15 year old kid, I was like, holy cow, galaxy, what is that all about? Found it with binoculars, you know, and, uh, I was on a late September evening. It looks hazy and blurry from back there because that's what it looks like through binoculars, hazy and blurry. It led to me getting a small refractor telescope, but it led to me becoming a, a, a passionate astronomer. That's how I got my star with the Andromeda galaxy. Brings me back to this issue of sky and telescope that I mentioned at the beginning. In addition to the, a nice article about Henrietta Swan Levitt, there was a, a separate article in there about seeing stars in the Andromeda galaxy, and amateurs. 
I'm like, what do you mean? We can see stars and they're two million light years away, two and a half billion light years away. People are actually able to see individual stars in the Andromeda galaxy. So this got me going, you know, <laughs> like it, it's so far, it was unfathomable to me to, to realize that, oh, to be to read an article that said that we can pick out stars in the Andromeda galaxy. Is the, is the uh, gigantic Hooker telescope down the bottom there. That's, <laughs> that's the telescope I'm working with. <laughs> a little five-inch refractor compared to the hundred-inch telescope. But that didn't stop me. Oh yeah. A hundred years of technology. Put a CCD camera into my hands. I put it on the back of a five-inch refractor. It's on the back of a Takahashi refractor here. My little backyard observatory. I started by snapping. I started by snapping this on a three-inch telescope. This I needed the smaller wide-field telescope to capture the whole galaxy, which you can see there. There's that M110, M32, and the big M31 Andromeda galaxy. The area of interest for me is that plate six that I showed you earlier that was shown in this book here. You know, I wanted to I wanted to replicate. The, the same area that the Lick Observatory took. Um, so I used the five inch telescope for that. Here's what I came up with. I um, exposed 15 frames at three minutes each, which adds up to 45 minutes. Three times 15 is 45 minutes, which is exactly the amount of time that was given to Hubble's original glass plate. That was a 45 minute exposure. You know, he was working with chemicals on a thin piece of glass and I was working with this highfalutin uh, modern day imaging equipment. So I got this area. There's his plate. There's my picture. I put his plate over my picture, which I'm going to show you one more time in Photoshop and show you what I came up with. Got a screen share again. You see that? Okay. So let me let me turn this off. There's there's my picture back there, and in color here, I I put the same markings that he had on his plate on my picture, and I'll show you what that means. First, I need to switch this to um, to the positive, invert it to the positive. Okay. So now we have his plate over my picture. I zoom way on it, way in on his variable. Bravo. I crank down the opacity a little bit. You can see my image come through in color. And there's that little triangle there. Um, if I make it about 50%, I can go back and forth. You can see it. So look at that. You can even see that the brightness changes a little bit. Oh, on, that's cool. That's on, cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what's going on I got all tingly when I saw this happen. <laughs> <laughs> Believe yeah. me. Um, so right now you can see. Let me turn off. Okay, right now this is my image. This is strictly one hundred percent my image, and you can see that in his image it's brighter, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, so we caught it at a good time. Um, I caught it towards the dim end. Like I said, this ranges in magnitude from 18 to 19.7. I'm going to get to that. All right. I, don't, I don't want an extended time here, but I'm almost through. Um, just to recap, just to look at uh, some of his some of his work. See, he, he pointed out the star here. This is strictly his plate right here. He pointed to that star as a nova. And when I take away his plate, sure enough, it's gone. See that? So he saw this star flare up. And when I take it away, the nova is gone. So he was accurate in, in determining that that was a nova. Uh, if I go to the other one over here, again, this is this is 100%. His plate, it shows that star. And when I take that away, 
that too is gone. It over, they only last you know a few weeks to a few months, um, and then they fade back into uh, oblivion. Um, but you can see between his picture and my picture that it was certainly there 100 years ago and not there now. In studying these plates and looking at them more carefully, this is my this is uh, my picture that we're looking at here, and you see that the little pink arrow. Now we put his picture on top of it. See that? Did he miss a nova? <laughs> it looks like he may have missed one there. Back in the day, there was no such thing as hot pixels. You know, like you get a lot of CCD cameras. So if I switch it like 50-50 here, see how that blinks on and off? The other stars look like they change in brightness. It's only because I couldn't match up the brightness you know, based on his picture versus mine, but it certainly, it certainly shows things that were there and not there over time. So either he's got an artifact on the plate or he missed an over there. Or, and that's, it's, a, or it's a long period variable. Very maybe. Long, very long period. That could be. That could be. I want you to look into that, Marcus. Okay. And then finally, and I was studying these two plates here. Um, take a look at this change the opacity. So we're looking at Hubble's image and then we're looking at see that star move quite a bit? Yeah. yeah. See that? Yeah. It's much more local. So yeah, you can compare where it is in relation to that one. That's his image. That's my image. That's a good one. The other ones pretty much stayed put. So I became curious about that. I'm like, what is that? Another moving star, perhaps? Yeah. So I'm done with this here. I'm going to go back here. Oops. Shit. OK. Um, so fast forward to the Gaia Space Observatory. Um, this was launched by the European Space Agency. Um, it's cataloged millions of stars up there, measures the positions and distances. It looks at them over and over again. It takes all kinds of readings. It's where I got the information on that moving star that I discovered inadvertently a, a few years back. And what I found was for that star that it actually is um, is it one of our own Milky Way stars? And I show where it was in 1923 over there in the, the Hubble image and where it was in 2021. That's when I took that, that five inch telescope image. And you can see, and you, using like the guy uh, information, I was able to find the designation for that star. You know, it belongs to our Milky Way and it has the 14th magnitude and, and you know, the parameters of that particular star. So it's simply one that's moving across the field of view that over a hundred years, you know, shows up on a plate. So in near conclusion here, um, the September issue of Sky and Telescope might even be in your hot little hands at this point or at home. Um, it has a nice article about what I just covered called Hubble's Eureka Moment. Um, perfect article. It's perfect if you want to recap on what I just spoke about for the past hour and a half. Um, it's written up very well in there. The last couple of paragraphs, the author is named Dave Tosteson. He talks about actually seeing that star visually with a giant reflector telescope. Um, he, he swears he, he saw it at 306, uh, between 360x and 650x. He saw it. Um, with a, you can't find the size of the telescope, but it was pretty large. Um, so some interesting reading there if you want to look further into this. There's also a nice article about it in the September issue of The Reflector, which I think you may all receive at home as members of the club here. Mm -hmm. And um, so now I think you have a better understanding of who Henrietta Swan Levitt was. I know Scott's a big fan. We had a little talk about that later on tonight when you're at dinner. I want you to, to realize that when before her work, the known universe was only the, the width of the Milky Way, 100,000 years. Now it's known to be 93 billion years in diameter. Um, I have a hard time figuring out how they 
Understood calculate 93 billion because if you look one way well 13.7 billion 13.7 billion there's a youtube video that explains this and i watched it but i still don't understand it so i'm going to try to explain it conspiracy theory. so raise your glass yeah, it's a henrietta swan levitt <laughs> and uh and just realize all the fantastic things that were happening 100 years Where'd ago you get this glass? what's that where'd you get that the it's people. a picture of a glass. Oh, it's just a picture of I don't have the glass. Oh, not, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'll follow the beer you want, but I don't have the glass. <laughs> so I, I'm through with my presentation. Um, uh, be happy to answer any questions for you, but I know I have a lot of intelligent folks here, and I have three quick questions for you. I promise they won't go too long. I know this has been a, a long presentation, but first of all, do you have any questions for me? Um, oh, your observatory, you built that, right? Yes, yeah, so I did. I'll talk to you later. Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's a picture of it out there in the, the landscape competition for astrophotography. 